We are going to be joined now by Pat Kondo, uh, the serial founder and CEO of Seeker Technologies, um, to share some of his perspective and experience on launching and growing uh, AI companies. We're also joined by Rich Haruska, the COO of the Tim Kinnett's family office, who will be leading this discussion. Um, Rich, the floor is yours. Hello from Tampa Bay. Uh, again, my name is Rich Haruska. I have the pleasure of being the chief operating officer of the Kinnett's family office. We're a single family office locations in Tampa Bay and also Iowa. Uh, for the purpose of this audience, we just started making venture investments about a year ago. We've made a good handful so far, and three of them are already unicorns. We're pretty excited about that. Um, so, Pat, I'm honored and thrilled to have this fireside with you. It just kind of makes me think a year ago, I was actually in the secret de deal room doing due diligence <laughs> and kind of, you know, vetting it that way. And here we are a year later having this awesome conversation. So how much time flies by. And um, for the sake of the audience, I just want to share, we're kind of breaking this conversation into kind of three key parts. First, kind of understanding a little bit more about Patent Seeker. Second, we're going to turn into kind of FinTech and AI, which I know is a key focal point of this group. And lastly, you know, I'm sure many of the founders in this, um, you know, conference have a lot of thoughts and want advice on seeking capital, seeking, you know, customers and uh, no pun intended on the seeking, but Pat certainly has some great insight and intel there as well. So without further ado, Pat, I want to kick it off to you and uh, just have you give a quick background on yourself and, you know, just a little bit about your background. Sure, Rich. Um, yeah, it was, it seems like it was longer than a year ago, but here we are. Um, <laughs> and I have to say you did uh, one of the more thorough due diligences I've seen. So uh, congratulations to that. But um, yeah, I started out about 35 years ago. Um, I went into uh, defense and intelligence uh, contractors, Northrop Grumman, Harris Semiconductor, and kind of worked on navigation systems for space and missile platforms. Did that for about uh, seven or eight years. And then um, Allen and Company in New York came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in um, building. A, they had purchased a technology company, which they didn't know why they bought it. And uh, it was really the the, the beginnings of uh, search technology. It was based on pattern recognition and, and it had, did all sorts of things around signal detection. And I thought it was interesting. So I went into it and uh, here I am 30 years later still you know, in the same business, uh, it has changed dramatically. Uh, I've formed five companies since that point. Two of them I've taken public. Um, mm -hmm. One that I sold to Intel for over a billion dollars when it was a real billion. And, uh, <laughs> sec and then second, uh, another one that what became the largest supplier of uh, search technology for defense and intelligence business. And uh, now here I am, I started Seeker about five years ago. And it really, you know, kind of brought together all the things that I've really done in my career um, into, into this new company, Seeker. That's incredible, Pat. Congrats on all your successes and for being here with us today and look forward to digging in deeper. It's interesting you say what a billion used to be, right? How the world has evolved. I'm still proud of the three unicorns we have in our portfolio, but I realize in this day and age of valuations and where we're at. So we're going to dig into that a little bit more. But um, could you share a little bit more with the audience, kind of the inspiration behind Seeker? What, you know, after having four companies before this, what got you kind of compelled to say, I'm going to go back in the ring and start up another company and just share with that journey and how's the vision evolved over time? And, you know, I'm sure the audience would love any pivots along the way as well. So 2016, um, I, I was in London and uh, I met up with some friends of mine that worked for uh, GCHQ, which is like the NSA of uh, the UK. Mm -hmm. And they said, um, hey, did you see what happened with Brexit? And I said, um, yeah. And they said, did you see what happened with Cambridge Ana Analytica? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, the same thing's going to happen in the United States. Um, and I started to think about that. And I said, looked into it a little bit more. And I said, um, this is an interesting problem. The As the internet has grown, so has the percentage of what I would call coordinated inauthentic behavior, mm -hmm. where deceptive information or false and misleading data is beginning to grow at an alarming rate. And uh, what could we do about it? And when you think about um, search and you think about profiling and you think about all those aspects, you know, a big part of that um, to give search results, you have to score data. And I said, what if we could apply everything we knew plus all the new things that we're doing in deep learning and neural networking and, um, and AI and come up with a way 
you know, to understand the content, score the content, and then do some good for society and make people aware that everything you read um, is not perhaps what it should be. Right. And then how damaging is the impact? And so we did a little more research and we found that, of course, the, the biggest impacts are in your financial systems, in your uh, systems around health and in politics. And we said, well, let's explore this a little bit more. And so the inspiration was doing something good for society, but form, you know, trying to solve a problem that we could see growing that would affect everybody downstream. And then the final thing that we did was we accurately predicted that as AI began to emerge in more of a consumer models, that the ability for somebody to create new content at a scale that's never been seen, and whether it's mischief or true malcontent, it, it's going to be destructive. And so Seeker was really born out of trying to solve that problem and then providing people with the tools and the technology to, to sort through the bias, the errors, what we call hallucinations, to really build a model today that can you know, be effective for them, either driving more revenues or preserving their brand or securing you know, new customers, any of those different things. But it all comes down to having trustworthy uh, information and data to base your, prob your product on. Excellent. And you mentioned, by the way, that you sold a company previously to Intel. One thing that dawned on me as I got to learn about the Seeker story was how they were reconnecting with prior companies and founders of theirs and wanted yeah. to understand what you're building today. I'd just be curious to get you to share with the audience kind of the importance of them seeing the behind the scenes technology and the the underworkings of what you're building and how that mattered what you do today. So they so so technical companies that are technology companies, the the very first step in any diligence is not the business, it's the technology. Does does it work? They, they've all seen a million PowerPoints. They they can see everything, but right. at the end of the day, they want to test it. They want to run it against large volumes. They want to run it in the environments that you say it can run in. They want to see if the problems you say you can solve, you can solve. So the, the rigor involved really when you're dealing with another tech company is, the, is, is almost the not invented here syndrome where you have to go through and prove that you can do what you say you can do, and you're an expert in that area. And that's what we had to do um, with Intel and with all of the technology partners. And once we were able to do that, you know, the business propositions naturally flow. Right. That, that's incredible. You know, speaking of billion dollars and what it means today versus what it used to yeah. mean, you know, it's it's candidly, I don't know about the audience, hard to keep up with the large language model universe and all the players and it's hard to keep up. You have OpenAI, Cohere, Anthropic. You know, I don't know if everybody watches uh, Monday Night Football. They had a commercial with Jim Harbaugh on perplexity. It was kind of a neat commercial. Um, yeah. You know, all these large language models and, you know, a C and a wide universe. How does Seeker, just to dig in a little bit, Pat, how does Seeker stand out from the crowd? So we, we it's focus and it's on a particular problem and that we are, that we have the all of the background and all of the you know, tools and the assembled workforce to be able to solve because we knew the problem was not it was not it small. Sure. It was present across all verticals. And we felt that the idea is solve it for a set of verticals, get Lighthouse customers in those verticals and prove that you uh, can do what you say you can do and do it better than anyone else. And then once you can do it, you can expand vertical by vertical across the spectrum because it's a common thread. It becomes more of a horizontal product as opposed to, say, a deep vertical. And that was the that was the approach we took. So we stand out um, really as the only company today that 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 can build products that can remove an errors, bias, put trust back into the quality of the data that you then run through your model, but also give you the tools to be able to do that. Uh, so all of that is, is really kind of the functionality that we provide, uh, how a customer of ours takes it like uh, One Valley as an example, and then built out their series of AI apps using that tool where that when they did that demo that they showed you to bring together 
uh, six or seven different um, companies from the web, they sorted out a lot of garbage because, you know, when you do a search result, you know, there's people are putting popular content to the top of the list, not credible. And so part of the whole process was what One Valley showed you were the most credible suppliers of the information mm -hmm. um, to be delivered to that customer base, as opposed to here's just a set of the popular data, which could contain, as they say, hallucinations. Very good. Well, kind of evolve the conversation. I know a lot of the audience wants to know about fintech and financial services, yeah. how it relates to AI. Um, you know, what kind of impact do you anticipate and see in the financial services industry and AI coming together? Well, so some of the guests have talked about certain areas of um, where um, security is important, where privacy, uh, where uh, fraud, those areas are very important to, you know, the total picture, but there are other applications of AI that are also important. And so uh, what what we look at are things like um, the, in the FinTech arena, or let's call it finance vertical, mm -hmm. uh, there are, what we're looking at is building intelligent agents and building rational agents so that um, a consumer could essentially set up a, some tasks that they are interested in around finance or around personal finance or around their own wealth management or around you know understanding content and this then can evolve where you can create your own agents and then the uniqueness of a particular finance individual or a firm becomes how well they use those agents so intelligent agents that can go out and learn by experience, rational agents that can, you know, build a, a portfolio or a profile based on your interests or your actions. These, this is where we see um, the, the broad use of these kinds of technologies and companies like One Valley will start to develop those and others that we're working with. So we're in, in a part of that is for those agents to be effective, they need to screen the data that is going into giving you a recommendation or giving you a suggestion or taking an action on your behalf. And that's where um, all of the signal analysis and detection that we do comes into play because now those agents, uh, you're gonna now trust those agents. Today, you may not trust them to make a, right. a stock transaction or withdraw money from your bank account or you know sign up for an insurance policy, but in a few years, you'll want to. Excellent. And the building on that, how do you handle kind of the ethical considerations, you know, bias, privacy, you know, a lot of sensitive data. How are you kind of attacking that challenge? So so we, you know, we build in what um, what the industry suggests. So for Europe, it's GDPR and we follow along with what they want. Um, in the U.S., there is a set of policies that are being developed. We're really. Um, an OEM to a customer who would in, implement those privileges and rules. And so when the system is designed, we expect that they would say, here's the group that has the privilege to see this. Here's the group that doesn't. Here's the data that needs to be um, obfuscated. Here's the data that doesn't have to. So those rules, those privileges really are set. And then we um, we put those in motion um, as we start to you know supply the technology. And then the Kind of the confluence of those two things is what that customer will offer to the end user. That's awesome. One thing I meant to say earlier is I really appreciate all the founders and industry leaders on this conference because I view this as you're working on the business, not necessarily in the business. And there's that very struggle. I'm sure everybody's toggling back and forth and emails and texts and whatnot. But building on that, you know, I want to be opportunistic a little bit in this call as well for the audience, for you, Pat. You know, what opportunities do you see for future partnerships between Seeker and startups looking to leverage AI and your technologies? So one of the interesting kind of phenomena that are occurring today is that when ChatGPT came out, enormous rush, everybody in the in the world is trying it and building mini applications on it. And the enterprise, the corporate customers were caught by surprise and stepped back a bit. So the first wave was all about consumer adoption and interest at that level. Then the second wave was that 
corporations started to get involved. And mm -hmm. what they discovered, of course, is that um, there's all sorts of um, let's concerns as they start to build or look at deploying enterprise class products. And so lots of them have stepped back and said, I want to take a little bit of time to look at this. I'm going to go look at what Microsoft's got or what Google has or what Amazon's doing. And I want to evaluate this. And so um, we're now in a phase where it's cautious movement forward. People are looking at um, how much does it cost? What's the return on investment? How complex is this? Um, mm -hmm. You know, can I uh, downstream? How can I manage it and, and analyze it? And that's where I think the opportunity is for many of the people on this call, because the the ability to um, get involved now is wide open. You don't you don't have to be uh, Chat GBT. They're not going to take over everything. Right. Um, it, it, there's so many different opportunities as this kind of wave goes to the next. There are you know people building extensions to products. There's people building new ways to um, to deploy products. There's there's just so many things now because it's clear that there's lots of holes in you know, this wave that can be filled by enterprising companies that take the time to look at the problem, become an expert on the problem, and then go, you know, offer a solution. I think it's a golden time for that. You know, two years from now, it, it, it might be different, but I think now is the time. And somebody mentioned earlier that, you know, there's more VCs now than ever looking at, um, you know, what's, what's happening in this space. I'd also offer one other recommendation, and uh, Rich is a perfect example. There are family offices who are extremely active in this space. There are something like 40,000 family offices that have you know, net worth of a billion dollars or more that are investors. And I would uh, tell you that that, again, is an opportunity to take advantage of. No, that's excellent. And uh, before we turn into kind of one of my favorite segments, which is kind of, you know, the advice for founders in the sure. room, anything else on the fintech and AI side that you want to offer, Pat, or anything? Oh, no, I think, I think, look, I think, you know, it's it, it, the, the challenges are in, in those two arenas are well known. It's what is the provenance of the information? What's the lineage? And what was the objective? And in all cases, you know, having an, un, an understanding of that data is going to give you the ability to put a res, you know get results that can be measured and can be trusted and i think that's a common thread whether it's finance whether it's healthcare whether it's insurance anything that has to do with money or health those three things are invaluable to providing a solution to a customer excellent love it um you know, uh, I, I think I've shared with you before, Pat, in a prior world, I helped lead a technology accelerator. And every time I'd sit down with founders, you know, we'd have a lot of topics, but they want to know about capital, capital yeah. and capital. Right. Yeah. And you've built many companies. You've yeah. fundraised for them in different ways. I found your approach to Seeker was refreshingly unique and one <laughs> of the reasons we leaned in. And I'm glad you've evolved from where you were, too. So, yeah. Can you just share a little bit of the Seeker fundraising journey yeah. and uh, just tips on fundraising overall? Yeah, so uh, when I when I first had to fundraise, it was the hardest thing in the world because I had never had to ask for money before, except mm. for my father, who would always say no. <laughs> and so um, when I had to go fundraise, I found it was a real unique skill that people had. And so I, I didn't know how to do it. And I was fortunate that um, the bank that I worked with, you know, did a lot of it, but I sat and watched how that got done. And it's a real art how to do that. And so I've raised money publicly um, through, you know, raising money as a public company. Uh, privately, I've raised money through, you know, investors and VCs. But when I went forward here with Seeker, I decided that, um, you know, having gone through all the things I've gone through, that this idea of raising money through family offices, uh, high net worth individuals, uh, they, that channel has now come alive. 20 years ago, it really didn't exist. It was hard to find. Now it's a real lively channel 
where family offices and high net worth families have decided to do their own investing. They're smart enough to do their own diligence. They hire people that are experts in that from all the big funds, from all the big fields. So, and they are really, sometimes they are first movers because they are people that built their own companies. They, they're first generation builders and they know what it takes to build a company and they they look at, you know, who's in front of me and am I going to trust this person with my capital? And, uh, you know, what is it that, uh, that that it's about them that is um, reminds me of me, so I'm going to invest. That's not the same as a VC. That's not the same as an institution. They're managing somebody else's money. Right. This group's managing their money. And that's there's a big difference. Now, building on that, I remember you had shared that one of the strategies was that you believed the minute you go to that next level, there's going to be more perspectives, opinions, et cetera, et cetera, which there's a lot of good, but you were also trying to build out the model, build out the company. So if I'm understanding, you were pretty intentional with not going the That's right. level of institutional too early on, right? Yeah, I um, I felt like that I had, you know, at this point in my life, in this point in my career, that I had the right idea and that I was headed in the right direction. And I had, you know, synthesized everything that I needed to do to get to that point. And there were lots of doubters along the way. Um, I can remember when I first announced that we were going to go in this direction, you know, half the company kind of moaned and quit. Mm. And, uh, but I didn't care because I knew it was the right thing to do. And uh, so, you know, you have to, have the, I think, the strength to be able to do that. And lucky enough that I've been around a while. I had great friends, great advisors, great mentors. I know a lot of people um, are very young that are looking to do the same thing. And that's a huge advice that I would give you is find a mentor, find somebody that's done this before that can sit there and give you the confidence or give you the assurances to, to go be bold like that because Oftentimes you can bend to somebody else's point of view because you think it's going to satisfy a short term type of scenario and then it won't work. Your company won't work. So that's that's a big piece of advice that, that I would give people is if you've got an idea and you've done the work and you're the expert, um, you know, stick with it and find surround yourself with people who will be supporters. Yeah, one thing I just thought about, Pat, and I think it's relevant for this audience is, of course, investors are expecting you to show your your trajectory and oh. hockey stick. You know, they're expecting the technology to be there. There's a lot of high expectations. There's more investors, but the the game has evolved. So I really think the temperament, the culture of the team, the founder themselves really matters. And one thing I wanted to share um, with the audience, my first time meeting Pat after we had already made a decision, and this was before we did follow on, uh, follow on rounds, we sat with him for a good two hours. Just imagine each of you how busy you are, how much of a founder like Pat is busy. Never once looked at his phone, never once went into, he just, he just spent quality time and knowing he had 50 other things to do and partners like Tony Robbins that call him here and there, like just so many things going on. And you could just sense the culture of the team too. So, you know, they always talk about, are you betting on the jockey or the horse? Certainly we like the horse and seeker, but certainly Pat, you know, John and team were a big part of it too. So, you know, one other thing I would share briefly is they were very open and transparent. If they didn't have the perfect, you know, crystal clear answer on something, they shared it. They were open, transparent. So it's interesting. Pat talks about trustworthy AI. You know, I also believe for each of us, we have to be trustworthy in how we communicate with prospective investors. So we're almost near the end of our time, Pat, and it's been a great one. Um, you know, we talk about capital. Well, capital can come in other forms like customers. And I realize, you know, chicken and egg problems sometimes, but can you share your approach to and advice for founders and getting your first, you know, enterprise customers? I think that's really important is to get a customer. And I think you have to do almost whatever you have to do to get that one customer. Um, some people might not, might wince at the idea of giving somebody some equity, giving them some upside, giving them some special attention, um, doing, you know, some things that, uh, you know, m might be difficult, but once you have that, and, and, it, and it has to be the right customer, and the customer should agree that 
once you've kind of gotten to the point where you've proved your thesis, um, that they become an advocate for you. If you can get that and that customer is somebody in a segment that is important to you, it's it, it's the most important thing of all. Because in today's world, technology is talked about by everybody, but it comes down to, well, I can't understand all of that, but I can understand, do you have a customer? Do you have two customers? Is anyone paying for this? That becomes now the only benchmark that when it gets too technical, it's the only benchmark that works. Awesome. And uh, closing question, we always like to end with, you know, general advice to founders. So I'm going to have a fun one with you here, Pat, you know, okay. the, you know, five companies and a few gray hairs, you know, yeah. if you used to give the Pat as a, a younger entrepreneur, you know, you're still young in spirit, but you get my yeah. point, you know, what, what would you say to the Pat and many founders in this room just getting their start? Well, I think that you uh, don't give up. Um, I think that there's plenty of um, parts of the journey where it looks like you should give up. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a person that, um, you know, had a straight line up until it went down. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I wasn't accustomed to that. And, uh, it, you know, during 2007 through 2009, I, you know, went through a pretty difficult period, but I didn't give up. I, you know, did whatever I had to do to keep going. So I think if you give up, you'll you'll regret it. So if you choose to go down the path to build your own company, um, don't give up on it. You you have to just keep going and find every way to 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 accomplish it. And and you will do it if because lots of people give up. So you've got that benefit that it's only a small percentage of people that don't. But if you get through that you know, you win. Awesome, Pat. Well, thank you again for taking the time and uh, oh, my appreciate pleasure. what thank you do you. in the community and uh, looking forward to hearing the continued growth of Seeker. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Pat and Rich, uh, for the really insightful conversation and, and especially for the advice to the founders that are that are in the audience here with us today. Um, you know, Pat spent a little bit of time sharing about Seeker and the work that they do, their end-to-end -end data platform and how companies can leverage it. If you ever want to take advantage of Seeker's platforms, you want to connect with their AI advisory team, you can use the QR code on the screen to schedule a consultation with one of their AI experts, um, but an incredible team, you know, our trusted AI advisor for our AI initiatives um, and, and a great platform early stage founders can look forward to using.